Hello everybody and welcome back to the second shelf and to a tag video on Sunday all in honor of Adam from Memento Mori because it's still Memento Mori-a-thon. If you have missed that, um, Doris, Sean and Mel uh, and I, we gifted Adam for his birthday on in January a readathon called Momentum, Memento Mori-a-thon inclusive bingo card. Uh, I will leave all the relevant links down below. So the announcement videos, my, my own, but also uh, the videos of Doris, Sean and Mel. Uh, there's a link to the bingo card uh, if you want to uh, download that and participate, hopefully. Um, and in my announcement video, I talked about the row of the bingo card that I would choose and one of the tiles said the casual side and for that tile for that prompt um, I chose the casual 10 books tag that Adam made back when he still made videos and essentially the the tag was originally created by Sean who called it pick 10 books off your shelves and talk about them and then Adam made his own version of it, of course, that's what Adam does, and he called it the casual 10 books tag. And when I was thinking about what I wanted to do with this tag, first of all, I decided five books is quite enough for me, because as you know, I'm a babbler, and if I choose 10 books, the video will probably be half an hour long, and that's just too much for me. Um, so five books, there will only be five books. <clears throat> but the other thing is that the idea behind it is that you take books off your shelves that you hadn't talked about, at least not extensively, um, you know. And then I was thinking of Adam and his love for Dude Bro Lit and his struggle with female authors because he just can't except for Iris Murdoch, maybe, and Muriel Spark. Uh, but anyway, so I thought, this channel is going to go rogue, for Adam's sake, and I'll pick five books by male authors. Yes, you heard me right, five books by male authors. So I'm absolutely sure that I haven't talked about those books before on the channel, because I normally only feature books by female authors. So here you go, Adam. What friends are willing to do for you? It's just amazing to me. Um, and before I start with the first book, I just wanted also to maybe clarify, I actually do read books by male authors. Some of you viewers, commenters, ask me that um, uh, in the comments on a regular basis. And yes, I do. I just don't feature them on my channel. Um, uh, now, since I have the channel, um, I would say I read maybe 10, 20% of my yearly read, uh, uh, yearly reads are male authors. So I have enough to choose from, especially because in the past, um, like most people, I read a lot of uh, dead white dudes. <laughs> but anyway, so I do read them. And I picked uh, five um, that I really, really loved and reread a lot. That was my um, yeah, criteria uh, for picking is that I really love the book uh, and that I reread it a lot of times. So the first one is this, uh, Chaim Potok, My Name is Asha Lev, first published in 1972. Um, I read this book in the German translation first when I was in my early 20s, I would say, and I was absolutely blown away. And then later on, I bought this you know, English edition, the original edition, and I've reread it multiple, multiple times. Uh, Chaim Potok was an American author. He died just 18 years ago or something. He was born in 1929. He was also um, a Jewish rabbi, and many of his books deal with uh, Judaism or uh, the Jewish faith or practice, culture, things like that. This book is as the title says, about Asha Lev. He is um, uh, growing up in Brooklyn, post-war, post-World War II Brooklyn, um, in a very tight-knit Orthodox Jewish community. And from an early age on, Asha Lev has um, 
it, 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 talent for for painting, drawing. He is a really talented uh, artist, obviously, all, already as a child. And the book then um, tells us about his struggle to combine or to come to terms, I should rather say, um, with his artistic uh, endeavor, his his need to express himself artistically, uh, which which is not something becoming a painter or an artist is not something that his um, very conservative community uh, would like him to do. Um, so that is one side, and the other side, to, to finish that sentence that I started like half an hour ago, he tries to come to terms with the, the, his artistic side, and also um, his uh, upbringing, um, the Jewish faith, the, the orthodox rules uh, that he was brought up in. I thought it was a, a fascinating book. Um, uh, it, it It really drew me in the writing is is wonderful and the the really heart-wrenching struggle of this first person protagonist uh, made me love the book and reread it multiple times next up is a german book because i wanted to throw in at least one book for the read german books 2020 uh year-long readathon that Mel and I are organizing. I will leave a link to the Goodreads group down below if you are interested. And the book I chose is uh, Patrick Süskind, Das Parfum, um, Geschichte eines Mörders, The Perfume, Story of a Murderer, first published in 1985. And the link uh, down below uh, to the Goodreads site is to the English translation. So it is available in English and other translations. Uh, Patrick Süskind is a German author that I didn't particularly, you know, adore or read. Um, and this is still my the only book by him that I really love. It's historical fiction, and despite the, the title, Story of a Murderer, it's not crime fiction. <laughs> I mean, there is crime in it, but it's not uh, your typical genre fiction. So it's set in Paris, um, and it starts in 1738 when the protagonist, um, Jean-Baptiste Grenouille, is born. Um, uh, he is uh, from a very, very poor background, um, and uh, his mother uh, discards him, and then he's brought up. Uh, he struggles uh, to find his way, and one of his... Um, there are actually two main features that distinguish um, Jean-Baptiste. And the first one is that he himself is completely odorless. So he has no body smell at all. But he has, he is an olfactor genius. So he has a very, very um, uh, good sense of smell. And he starts uh, to be a, the apprentice of somebody who makes perfumes. Um, and he is especially drawn to the smell uh, of people. So he starts to collect um, uh, extraordinary smells. He starts to make perfumes. He becomes really wealthy because he is extremely good at his profession. But of course, story of a murderer. There is also quite some murder in the book. If you haven't read it, I'm not going to tell you more than that because that, that would spoil um, the twists and turns of the story. But I, I thought it was fabulous. I It's a fast-paced, entertaining read um, about this, uh, this young man and about perfume. So if you've never read it, I can certainly recommend it, especially if you're participating, uh, participating in Read German Books 2020. Next up is... Brad Easton Ellis, Glamorama, first published in 1998. Um, and um, you might be surprised that I love Brad Easton Ellis, at least his later work, American Psycho and Glamorama, I thought were fantastic. Uh, Brad Easton Ellis, uh, of course, uh, is an American author. He was born in 1964, and he's kind of an enfant terrible. Um, he can be uh, he, he can be quite a twat if you listen to interviews um, by him. Um, and he gained fame uh, very early on uh, with uh, the book Less Than Zero. 
um, about youth his youth basically um, and this one if you read American Psycho you will remember that the um, the book was about the 1980s and the materialistic culture and in Glamorama Brad Easton Ellis takes on the 1990s um, so the main protagonist is Victor a very beautiful uh, young man who works as a model and the book follows his life that takes quite some unexpected turns because the book is not only about celebrity culture and the um, the obsession um, uh, that a society has with beauty and celebrity, but it takes on it, it takes a darker turn, also tackling uh, surveillance, uh, terrorism, which I think was pretty, you know, like... Uh, foreseeing the future uh, when you think about the book that it was published in 1998. Um, I, it's a wild ride. If you have read other books by Brad Easton Ellis, you will know what I mean. Um, it's one of those books that when you finish it, you wonder, did it all really happen? Was it just a dream? Was it just a fantasy? That's the typical Brad Easton Ellis manner, I would say. I, I thought it it was hilarious. It was, despite the dark turns, quite funny at times um, and very satirical. So if you are into that kind of book, uh, this might be a good choice for you. My fourth pick is by an author that I really admire, and that is John Benville's The Infinitives. Infinities, uh, first published in 2009. Uh, John Benwell is an Irish author. He was born in 1945 and I really adore his work. Not, not everything as it always happens when you, you know, read almost all of the books by a particular author, but I think he is extremely inventive language-wise and story-wise. Um, I picked this one because it's sort of a lesser known book and it might not appeal to everybody, but I, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, it's set in the countryside uh, when the patriarch of a family, Adam, who was a famous mathematician struggling with the infinities, uh, is lying on his deathbed and his family is gathering around. You have his wife, um, Helen, and his two uh, uh, children, Adam Jr. and Ursula. And when you when you open when the book opens, you just think it's you know a family story set in the countryside, and there's the patriarch, and the, there's tensions between the various family members. But there are these hints early on that this book is actually set in a sort of alternate version of our reality. You have steam trains still going on. And there are Greek gods floating around, Zeus and Hermes, and they are mischievous and they interfere with the lives um, of these uh, family members. I thought it was, <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, the, the main theme is, of course, still family relations, but also um, the, the struggle with the, with the metaphysical, with the godly. And the last name of the family is Godly. So there you have your hint. Uh, but because it's it's set in this sort of alternate world, it also has a, a fairy tale feel to it. And I mean that in a good way, because if you know me, if you're following my channel, I'm not into, you know, the the mystical and the, this sort of weird uh, fantasy kind of thing. I, that's normally not my thing. So I was even more surprised how much I liked this book. And I thought the gods were hilarious <laughs> because they just want to, you know, make it more difficult for this family. So if you, I don't know, if you want to explore John Benville if you have never read him. I don't know whether this is the best book to start with, but it's, it's um, yeah, it's a very tender, uh, emotional tale of this family um, being surrounded by these gods floating around. I don't know. I just loved it. The last one is kind of a dystopian 
novel and that is Greg Herbeck, uh, Not on Fire but Burning, first published in 2015. Um, I had never heard of this author and I came across this book by chance. I think it was somebody on Booktube who talked about this book and I'm really happy I did. Uh, Greg Herbeck is an American author um, and this, this more or less dystopian fiction um, tries to um, fictionalize 9-11 and the aftermath. So the book opens with a 9-11-like event, uh, but this time it's uh, a bomb exploding in San Francisco destroying the city. And there's radiation afterwards, um, and the book then jumps um, about 10 years or something, um, and we follow the Wakefield, Wakefield family, especially the 12-year-old son, Dorian, trying to deal with the aftermath of this event. And things really pick up pace when Dorian befriends his new neighbor, Karim, who is a Muslim orphan. Um, and the Muslims, even though it's not clear who is responsible for the San Francisco attack, but the Muslims are blamed by the government. They are put into camps. They are surveyed. And the friendship between Dorian and Karim then develops in the sense that both boys have to make difficult choices um, and there are quite extreme situations and positions that they are put in. That's all I want to say without giving away the story. Um, and that idea of how the world, in this case the United States, deals with um, a horrific um, a terrorist attack and what it means for the society, but also what it means for individual people, I thought was really well done. The language is very poetic, almost too beautiful for the, for the, the, the horrors that are uh, described in the book. Um, and it is a, a bit of a weird story, if you know what I mean. So if you're not into dystopian and a bit weird, then this might not be a book for you. But I thought it, it was brilliant and I can highly recommend it if you are into this kind of thing. So those were my five books by male authors. We're not going to make a habit out of that, I can promise you, uh, for the 10 books, the casual 10 books book tag. Maybe I do another one with another five. I'm not sure yet, but it, this is it for now. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. As always, I'm looking forward to, uh, to your comments and I'll see you all soon in the next one.